the rich have too much and the poor don't have as much, it seems reasonable for us to spend a little bit of time making the case for what it would take to create a perfectly equal income distribution. It's actually really simple. All we need are three things. And we wouldn't have to worry about income inequality at all. If we had homogeneous people who were exactly the same, gosh, the medical, medical technology exists uh, to be able to do that. We just clone, right, our most productive people. Uh, we have a bunch of clones out there. That would be easy, right? Then what do we have to do? Well, just uh, let's have everybody do the same job, right? So forget all these uh, variety of jobs that you're studying different majors. We'll all just go do the same thing. Um, and then wherever those jobs might be, as long as you were willing to go and work them, well then, we can be guaranteed that there'd never be an oversupply of workers in one place uh, or an undersupply in the other, and that there'd always be a worker to take on that job, right? So whenever the worker showed up, they'd be equally capable, right? And the job would be the same, so the worker wouldn't care what job they were doing, and they wouldn't care where it was. I could guarantee you that our marketplace would produce an outcome where everybody got paid the same thing. Is that remotely desirable. It's like, that's bad right there, right? You can look around the room and just see that we have a nice, vibrant mix of people with different interests and skill sets and abilities. So that doesn't reflect what we have here, here, or even here, all right? So just to, to prove the last point about mobility, how many of you are thinking down the road um, that ideally you'd like to find a job somewhere here in Pennsylvania. Who would say that would be my plan? Okay, so some of you are saying yes. How about anywhere in the Northeast or Mid-Atlantic? How about anywhere in the U.S. would be fine? Who says I'm willing to go anywhere around the globe if the right job is there? Okay, so that little set right there of the people who are willing to go anywhere that job might be, is the reason why the third point doesn't hold as well. Uh, and just to sort of get to a logical conclusion here, what do we have? We've got people who have preferences for big cities and small towns, and living on the coast and living in the mountains, and warm climates and cold climates. Uh, we got all kinds of different preferences out there. They matter to all of us to a greater or lesser degree, and so therefore what you're gonna find in the most attractive places, you have a large number of people who'd be willing to work there, that's very different from the places where they're rural, they're isolated for whatever reason, they're unattractive, um, or they're just hard to live in. Um, and so what you get is you get less workers in those areas, and therefore you get correspondingly higher prices. So yeah, we can create perfect equality if that's the initial set of conditions. Those are not the initial set of conditions. So to get you thinking about this, I have a little activity for you guys uh, to do. So I'd like you to pull out a piece of paper, put your name on the top of it. And then we're going to transform our classroom into a room filled with workers trying to produce an economic product. All right? That's what we're all going to be doing. We're going to have a very short amount of time to produce as much of this product as possible to make as much in the way of participation points as possible. So while you guys are getting this sheet of paper out, I will uh, get this ready. Okay. So I'm going to be asking you to write a phrase that's going to show up on the screen for the next five minutes. Right? And so basically what you're going to be doing is just going to be writing it on this sheet of paper. And the more times you can write it, well, then the more participation points you get. Um, and so I'm trying to measure productivity. So in order to get you to work hard, I'm going to pay you $25 in participation for each legible phrase that you write. And so you'll have five minutes to jot this down as many times as possible. Is everybody ready? Uh, no, no. The phrase is going to show up right here. And everybody's going to write the same phrase. So you should, there's nothing to write yet. Does everybody have a pencil or a pen and a piece of paper? Okay. That's awesome. So, are you guys ready? We're so close to being ready. Now, we're all ready. Go! You don't have to fill in the heart, but you have to actually write them.
ask you to do, if you could uh, exchange papers with somebody nearby, and they'll add up the number that you uh, prayed that you were able to write, and circle that on the top of the sheet, that'd be awesome. And then we're going to use all of this data to construct an income distribution and also to look at what's called uh, uh, quintile analysis. And that'll give us a sense of uh, who the rich people of the class are based on this uh, activity and then the, who those who are not so successful. So uh, once you've had a chance to uh, exchange and then add up the total, if you could pass those towards the two aisles and down towards the front, I'll collect them. Um, but I want to use your individual results um, to come up with an income distribution because that will help us to think about um, the issues that are at hand here. And, and I want to start with the following. Who here was able to write the phrase 100 times or more? That's almost one out of five people, which is actually really cool. Because uh, what we're going to use is a quintile analysis. The quintile analysis works the following. What you do is you break the data into five groups. And what you want to know is who are your top 20%, the top quintile. Um, and you want to figure out who those performers are. Then you want to look at the next highest quintile, those who are between the 60th and 80th percentile the middle quintile, 40th and 60th percentile, the middle lower, and then finally you want to look at the bottom quintile. So now, if you guys can raise your hands again if you were 100 or more. What I'm going to do is um, I'm going to go a little bit higher than that. We're going to figure out who had the most productivity in the class. So who's got 105 or more? 110, 115, 120, 125, 130. 135, 140, 145, yes? 144, has anybody got more than 144? Awesome, all right, so 144 right there is the top of the upper quintile. So while we're thinking about this, what I'm gonna do is simply switch to the document camera. And here's what we've got. We've got the top quintile, and it ranged from 100. You could get into the top group with a score of 100, and 144 was the top score. Now, I could just take the midpoint of that, um, but I don't think that'd be quite accurate here because most of the people in the top quintile were a whole lot closer to 100 than they were 144. So let's just call the average here. Uh, 115. Okay, that's my best guess of the average value among the top 20% of the class. Uh, and then what you do with quintile analysis is you largely ignore the middle 60%. And you go back and try to figure out who the low productivity workers are, the ones with the low incomes. So you also get to raise your hand if you're among uh, the worst performing members of the class. And uh, so I'll just uh, take a stab at who was at 70 or below. All right, that's awesome. That's right? about one in five people again. Okay, so keep your hands up proudly as I drop the number down to figure out if we can find the least productive number, okay? 65, 60, 55, 50, 50, 45, 40, 36. 36, all right, awesome. All right, so. We got 36 and we have 70, and that's the uh, lowest quintile. So here we've got a range of values that would qualify you as being in the lower group. And, and again, I think the actual average is closer to the 70 than it would be to the 36. So just for the sake of argument, let's uh, call the in this 50. 7.5. I'm just doing that for convenience. All right, because basically what I want to do here is I want to compare the performance among the top quintile with the lowest quintile. So what I'm going to do is divide the 115 
by 57.5. And what do I get? And I get two, right? So what does that mean? The average person in the top quintile was twice as productive as the average person in the, the lowest quintile. Now, that's for what? That's for an economic activity that took exactly five minutes. And so what I'd like you to think about here is how can we generalize the result? Um, so what we're doing is we're looking at quintiles, and then later we'll look at this on a graph called a Lorenz curve. So the way I want you to think about this is as follows. We've got a little economic microcosm. It's almost like in our little world right here in Chambers Building, that there were so many workers and we were going to reward workers based upon how much they produced. Some workers produced a lot, some didn't produce as much. Since everybody's being paid $25 for the phrase, I love econ, you wrote it a lot of times, right, the 144 compared to the 36, you know, she's about four times as productive as, as he was, all right? She'd be the top earner of the class. Um, and then among the high earners, they'd have roughly twice the income as the, the low earning group. And in the middle, everybody would be pretty close together. That'd be everybody between 70 uh, and 100. So, so when you think about the microcosm, here's the part that's interesting. You guys are all roughly the same age. Um, and the way the experiment is set up is you all have the same opportunity to succeed. You've got the same amount of time. You've each got a paper and a pen or a pencil. Um, and so I just say, go. And, and so the, the outcome itself is designed to be uh, as fair as possible in terms of you producing a lot, but of course the end result isn't necessarily equal. So what you find is you get basic inequality arising in people's income, but that doesn't mean it was inequitable. In fact, the whole process was set up in such a way as to provide you the maximum opportunity to, to succeed. It's just what? There were differences in talent and to some extent motivation and in people's preferences. And some of you are just better writers than others. Now, if I had extended the activity to 10 minutes, how many of you would have gone hard for the full 10 minutes? How many of you have said at some point, I'm going to bail out? All right? There's a whole bunch of people bailing out, right? Uh, now, how, if I had said, hey, here's one way you can get a, an A in econ. You can just write, I love econ as many times as it takes to get a million dollars. How many of you would do that? <laughs> That's got to be a whole lot harder than actually learning econ, all right? So, but you know, some of you would say, I would do that, you know, I'd maybe farm it out, I'd pay a friend, I don't know what you would do. But, uh, you know, but that would be what? Untold hours of like staying after school and writing, I love econ. I love econ, right? That would be mind-numbingly bad, right? And of course, many of you would say at some point, I'm just not willing to do it. So there's not only differences in talent, there's also differences in motivation. This is my main point here. There's been a number of studies done like what you just did, but on a much larger scale. The one I'm familiar with was done in Canada. Um, they had a major recession, and they took unemployed workers from uh, a number of the major cities in Canada, and they said, hey, um, would you like to come and live in the country? We will take care of your uh, room. Uh, we'll give you food and we'll give you clothing. Uh, all you have to do is show up, we'll bust you there, there's no cost to you. So these are unemployed people. They got like 50 people to say, sure. And essentially what they did was they bust them to some fenced-in commune area in the middle of nowhere in Canada. Uh, and, and again, you're completely taken care of for six weeks. Uh, and they said, okay, now that you're here, um, if you're interested in making money, here's how we'd like you to make money. And they showed them a series of old uh, wood looms where you could basically make your own clothes. And for every time a person would use the looms and make the clothing, they would get paid a, a certain amount. Well, at the end of six weeks, again, these people have nothing better to do in the middle of nowhere in Canada, right? Uh, you could make money. What they found was the ratio between the top performers and the bottom performers was not 2.0 like we got here, all right? It was actually somewhere between six and seven. Um, and that's after six weeks. How do we measure income differences in this country? We measure them across an entire year, right? And we say, this is how much somebody made during the year, and this is how little somebody else made. And we compare the top group with the, the bottom group. 
Uh, there's going to be some natural amount of unemployment. There's going to be some people who become very satisfied, not want to work very hard. Uh, and there are going to be other people who have circumstances which prevent them from working. So I would argue to you that it's perfectly reasonable to expect, and this is the point here, that income inequality is not the aberration. That income inequality is the norm. Uh, and that trying to find solutions that generate perfect equality of income works against basic human nature and the differences that we find among people it makes it so interesting to live life right and so this is kind of a weird idea because i think our default is why can't it be more equal and my default is well it would be more equal if we were all the same and the jobs were the same and we all went to work different places but that's an entirely reasonable unreasonable set of assumptions so therefore, economists say, we expect inequality. And once we say we expect it, then we ask an interesting question. What's the right amount of income inequality? That's not a question that you hear ever talked about. But we'll talk about in this class, because that's the interesting way of phrasing what's going on.